I want to welcome each and every one of you to the People's Church online service. Today, I'm confident that God has a specific message, a unique message just for you. I know that we are living in difficult and challenging times, but let me tell you this. Don't allow your circumstances to speak louder than what God has planned for you through His Son, Jesus Christ. It's Jesus and what He did on the cross that has the power to change your life, to change my life. So at this time, let's go to God in prayer. And after that, we will join the People's Church worship team and praise and honor our God together. Let us pray. Our gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you today that you are our Father, that we worship a living and a holy God. We pray today that even as we worship you, that your presence would fill our hearts and fill our lives. Also pray today that the word that is spoken to our hearts will bring transformation and change and your power will do the impossible in our lives, in our families and through us to our nation. We just commit this hour to your hands. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen.
voice of the Lord. Amen. We have a great God. You know, over the past week, our pastors have been praying for many people and their families. This week, a brother told me how we had prayed for a financial situation in his workplace and how God had miraculously intervened and answered prayer and how a payment that is long overdue was paid up. You know, today, God is going to do a miracle in your life in your family, in your home, in your situation, in your circumstances. God is going to come through. We want to pray for you and your family. We also want to pray for our nation that God will continue to touch and to bless our country. Would you close your eyes and bow your heads with me even as we go to God in prayer. Our gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. Lord, I bring every individual, every couple, every family, every person that is represented today. I pray for your divine intervention in their lives, in their situations. Lord, they may be facing impossible situations, but you're the God of the impossible. You can make everything possible. Whether it be a sickness, whether it be a financial problem, Lord, whether it be an emotional problem, Lord, whether it may be a spiritual need, Lord, whatever the heart's need is, Lord, you know, and you hear, you can see, you can feel the need. And we pray for divine intervention and that you'll do the impossible, do the miraculous. Lord, do the work of healing in everyone's life today. Those who are looking to you, Lord, for your divine touch. We are praying, Lord, for a miracle of miracles. And we're praying for transformation. We're praying for healing. We're praying, Lord, for supply. We're praying for restoration. And we also pray for Sri Lanka today. Lord, we've been through difficult times. And Lord, even as we still continue, Lord, to bring our nation to that place that you have ordained our nation to be. I pray for the leaders of this land. I pray, Lord, for those in authority. I pray, Lord, for those who are in the business world. Lord, for those, Lord, who are in the commercial world. Lord, in every sector of society. I pray for a divine touch, for a divine intervention. And Lord, I pray that your provision will flow. Lord, your blessing would flow. Lord, to every person, to every home, and Lord, to every life. Give us hope even through the, Lord, the, the darkness that we sometimes see and bring hope where there is hopelessness. We just pray for healing. We're praying for your blessing. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. So at this time, we want to move to a very important part of our service. I want to listen to God's word. And today, we have a great man of God who has been mightily used across the nations. He is Reverend Dr. Ivan Satyavarta, served as a pastor of the Bantain Memorial Church in Kolkata, India. You know, he also serves as the chairman of the Kolkata Mission of Mercy, which is the social arm, which includes a hospital, a medical service, a school, a feeding program, where nearly 20,000 children a day receive meals and basic care uh, through this medical and, and feeding mission. So we really thank God for this man of God. Uh, he's a theologian, he's a pastor, he's a pastor of pastor, a leader of leaders. And today it's our joy to have him come to us here at People's Church and to bring to us God's word. The world has come through one of the most stressful times in modern history, hasn't it? You all know what I'm referring to. COVID virus in its deadly various expressions, variants, has unleashed, unleashed havoc across the globe since early 2020. There was a sense in which the whole world had become a battleground against this unseen enemy. And this dark cloud of fear and uncertainty still hangs over our world. All that to say, faith is under stress. If we are honest as people of faith, the struggles are not just out there, but in here. We find ourselves one wondering at times, is the world really under the control 
of a loving, almighty creator God? If so, why is there so much chaos and uncertainty? And if we think it, sometimes our friends who are not people of faith may throw that at us. You believe in God? Where's God in the midst of all of this? So in the rest of my time this morning, this message is trying to address the question, how does faith survive the kind of adversity such as we see all around us today? There was a prophet in the Old Testament who really struggled with this. He said, friends, sometimes we think prayers of doubt, prayers which express struggles are not spiritual. If that is so, listen to the prayer of the prophet Habakkuk, reading from chapter 1, verses 2 to 4. Oh Lord, how long must I call for help before you listen? Ever prayed that prayer? Don't raise your hand. How long must I call for help before you listen, before you save us from violence? Why do you make me see such trouble? How can you stand to look on such wrongdoing? Destruction and violence are all around me, and there is fighting and quarreling everywhere. Have you witnessed that? Verse 4. The law is weak and useless, and justice is never done. I know this doesn't happen in Sri Lanka. Evil people get the better of the righteous, and so justice is perverted. This is a prayer, friends, from the lips of a prophet. How does faith in God survive the kind of adversity that we are going through and experiencing right now? Well, before we come to the answer of faith, I want us to look at unbelief's answer. What's unbelief's answer? Okay. And I'm sharing this with you because if you have friends who question your faith, well, you can use some of this to throw it back at them. You know, if you're an unbeliever, you can't even ask that question. Why the pandemic? Why the tsunami? Why injustice or evil? It's a mean, meaningless question. Because the only answer you have to live with is, this is just the way things are in the world. Earthquakes happen, floods happen, mountains become valleys, predators hunt their prey. You can't ask, why does the tiger chase the deer or the fox chase the rabbit? You can't ask that question. You can't ask why leaves and flowers bloom and die. You can't ask. You can't ask. That's just the way things are. Not only that, there's no reason to care about victims of injustice, is there? Why feed the hungry or help those in need? If there is no God, why not let the poor remain poor in a dog-eat-dog -dog world? Listen, friends, just stop and think for a moment. You see, apart from God, there is no basis for compassion or justice in our world. We are just animals in a global jungle. And what you might term evil is just nature at work. So the first response of, uh, of unbelief is, you can't ask the question. At least that's how it should be. If someone ever challenges you, you can throw it back at them. Not only that, at a deeper level, you have no real basis for hope. A godless universe means that we are all alone in our fight against evil on the planet. No hope of wrongs ever being set right. No hope of injustice being judged. No hope of goodness ever being rewarded. Evil has the last word. 
I don't know if you agree with me, but I really believe the pain and injustice in our world, while believers may have to struggle with it sometimes, it's a bigger problem for the unbeliever. So get this, friends. The absence of faith does not remove or reduce evil and suffering. It only deepens it. What then is faith's response to adversity, to pain, evil around us? By the way, we don't have to have an answer. We don't have to have an answer. But faith does look to the Bible, and the Bible does give an explanation. First of all, the Bible tells us that we live in a broken world. The Bible teaches the world as we look at it today is not the world as it was meant to be. God created the world perfect. But he created human beings in that world with a potential to sin. With a free will. And our first parents, Adam and Eve, chose to sin. And the fall of man has marred God's perfect creation. Our world today which was spoiled, the evil poison of sin spread to the whole planet, is still broken, is still marred. Paul puts it like this in Romans chapter 8, verses 21 and 22. He says, all creation is under the curse. Creation is groaning due to death and decay. So that's the first answer the Bible gives us. In a broken world, pain and tragedy, either due to natural causes, such as earthquakes, hurricanes, pandemics, etc., or due to human choices, evil choices. Human beings choose to rape and murder. Leaders choose to take nations to war or generate riots. People make choices that are corrupt, resulting in unjust actions. So whether it's due to natural causes or human choices, there is evil in our world resulting in grief, pain, death, and disease. This is part of the normal human experience because we live in a broken world. But there's a second answer the Bible gives to us in response to the reality of adversity and evil around us. And that is we are not in control of our world. Human civilization has made massive progress, hasn't it? Through the power of science and technology, we can control a lot of things. We can manipulate uh, our world. We are able to cross the oceans. We are able to traverse the continents through air travel, these machines that human beings have made. We're even able to go out to outer space today. Technology today has an answer for almost everything. And by the way, God is not against human progress. But, but when a tsunami hits, when a pandemic comes, we are reminded that at the end of the day, humanity is helpless against the mighty force of nature. We are humbled. Human pride is forced to bow in submission to the powers that are beyond the mind of modern science and technology. We are reminded that it's God's universe. And so it's no accident that during the COVID season there are many people who never, believers or other Christians, for whom church was something they attended on a good day. They never felt any compulsion to go to church. But did you notice after 9-11, churches in the USA were full during COVID season? While people were not allowed to go to church, there was an unprecedented, you know, attraction to the spiritual. People suddenly became aware 
of the transcendent. We need to connect with something that is able to make meaning out of what's happening in our world today. The Bible teaches we live in a broken world. The Bible teaches that we are not in control of our world. Both of these come to us as a response to adversity, pain, and evil around us. But I thank God, friends, the Bible says more than that. Because the Bible teaches that we look forward in hope. We are people of hope. How many of us know that? We are people of hope. We are people who live in the present but have our eyes fixed on the future. Let me unpack that for you. What do we mean by this hope? What is the basis of this hope? Our hope is anchored in Christ and the cross. For the cross reveals a God who has taken the punishment of sin and suffered the pain of evil. Not only that, friends, the world sees the picture of a suffering savior. But faith sees what the Bible teaches that on the cross of Calvary, Christ dealt a death blow to evil. He conquered death by his resurrection on the third day. And those two events together represent the basis of our hope. He died on the cross. The Bible teaches he dealt the death blow to sin. And not only that, by his resurrection on the third day, he conquered death. But there's a corollary to that, that. What does it mean? He rose from the dead. Remember his words. Because I live, you shall live also. I want you to hear that promise again, friends. Jesus promised that every believer will be raised to life at the end of the age. I don't know if either through COVID or the recent period that you've gone through, you know, that you felt insecure about your life or about the future. It's important for us to be reminded at this time that our hope is grounded in the resurrection of Jesus. Listen to me, dear friends. The last chapter in your life, how many of us consider ourselves as true followers of Jesus? Let me see your hand. I know that's a stupid question. It's not your funeral. It's not the casket in which they bring you. It's not even the grave where they bury you. The last chapter in the life of every true believer is the sure and blessed hope of the resurrection. Thank you. There's somebody listening. Amen. One of these days, the curtain is going to fall down on history. As the world moves towards final judgment, God will deal with evil decisively and finally. It will be eliminated from our universe once and for all. That is the vision of, of the future that the Bible gives to us. And that's when God will bring in the new heavens and the new earth. Hallelujah. I don't know what your circumstances are like. God can and will change your circumstance. But listen to me. The bottom line is, even if it doesn't change, that's not where your life ends. My future, the future that every true believer looks forward to with eager anticipation, and that's the basis of our hope, is the new heavens and the new earth. Eternal life, free in a, in a universe that is free of evil of all kinds. Hallelujah. I don't know about you, friends, but the more I reflect on that in the midst of all the uncertainty of the times in which we live, my heart throbs with excitement, comfort, and hope. 
So, what do we do as believers? Do we go home after a service like that, like this, and sit on our hands and say, it's wonderful, you know, Pastor Dishan and all the pastors tell us we don't have to be afraid of, of life as it is. Our future is secure. We have eternal life. So let's go home and enjoy the rest of our lives, friends. What do you think? Jesus said, I came to bring life in all its fullness. And he said that after he said there's a thief who comes to kill, steal, and destroy. So on one hand, there is evil, Jesus said. There is a thief who comes to kill, steal, and destroy. On the other hand, I have come to bring you life in all its fullness. So what are you? Are you and I followers of Jesus? So what do you think we should be doing in a world that is surrounded by evil? Should we be content to sit at home on our hands and say, thank you, Lord, I'm saved. I, me, my two, no more. We four and no more. No, friends. If you are a believer worth the name, you know what we do? Even with the hope of eternal life and the new heavens and the new earth, we resist evil with all our might in the name of Jesus. That is why God has left us on the planet. To resist evil in his name. They're saying, Pastor, you're telling me, do you know my circumstances? Me, resist evil? I'm here to tell you this morning that you can make a difference. I want you to go home with two very profound words. You know, during the COVID season, I'm sure it was the same here, but in Calcutta, it was as though the ch it seemed like the church went into hibernation. We couldn't have services for the best part of two years. We did have services intermittently. All we could do is we would go early morning to the, the church campus before, because it was locked down. We were not supposed to step out of the ho our houses. But we would go early morning at 4.30, Pastor Dishan, record the service for the coming Sunday and go back while people were getting up. But that's all. Sunday morning, you turn on your TV. And so the pastors, we were worried. What's happening to the church? What's happening to the church? How are the people being ministered to? But as the curtain was lifted and we began to engage and get feedback, you know, like your church here, we have life groups. We call them care groups. And we found those care groups were more alive then than in the pre-COVID period. So, not sure how it was here, but in Calcutta and in India in general, if somebody was, you know, there's a member of a family that had COVID, particularly at the peak of the COVID period, people would treat them as lepers. L literally. Sometimes the neighbors would come and lock your door from outside and say, you know, don't step out. Uh, and they would have to keep a chair outside. And, you know, if you want anything, you left it, you know, certain time of the day, they'd open it. It was terrible. And everybody treats you like a leper. But you know what many of our believers did? They went to those houses, knocked at the door, and said, Hi, I'm sorry I hear you had COVID. But, you know, our church prays for people like you. Can I pray for you? Or can I help you in some way? And the people were stunned. They said, everybody's trying to avoid us. And you're here to help us. So we went, we suddenly saw believers emerging as servants of Jesus Christ. Wanting to reach out and make a difference. Friends, I wish I could tell you stories. The true life stories of how, you know, if, rather than the church... We thought the church was going into hibernation. The church was more alive than ever. So many testimonies of people being ministered to and as a result, being drawn to Jesus. And you know, uh, I said this in the previous services. Perhaps you're saying, you know, Pastor, my means are limited. I, there's not much I can do. One of the most moving stories we heard was of a widow 
who is unable to provide for her daily needs. Every day on her way back to her, her house, she would pass this beggar who was literally dying of starvation. So she took out whatever coins she had, went to a bakery opposite and said, you know what, I want you to supply a loaf of bread to this beggar every day and I promise to pay for it. She was living by faith each day herself. And because of this dear lady's compassion, that beggar made it through the COVID period, survived. You can make a difference. You can reduce the evil in our world by your choices. Friends, at, a, at, a, at another level, I want to share with you a personal experience we had as a church. Uh, we had, when we first came to Calcutta, uh, this happened very early in our time in Calcutta. You may have heard that during the rainy season, the city of Calcutta get, gets flooded. Okay. And I mean like Noah's flood. Noah's flood, it just gets... You, you're in, if you're lucky, you will have ankle-deep water. Most of the time, it's either knee-deep, sometimes waist-deep. So one Sunday morning, as my wife and I were headed to church, our first service that time started around 8 o'clock. And 7.30 is when we left the house to go to the church, just 10 minutes away. The clouds burst, and it began to pour like anything. And uh, my heart began to sink because I knew what's going to happen. I'm going to go to the church and there'll be less than half attendance. Sure enough, as we stepped into the church, got onto the platform where our pastors sit, I looked at the handful of people in the congregation. And of course, like any other service, there was worship, and people worshiping God, and confession as a pastor. While the worship was going on, I was sitting and complaining to the Lord. Pastor Deshan, you know, worse than Habakkuk's prayer. I said, God, you are the Lord of the universe. You control the elements. And exactly at the time when people are leaving to go to church, you allow this, this cloudburst. I mean, are you with us, for us, or against us? And I was really at a bad attitude. Uh, and as I was complaining this prayer, you know, God is gentle, but sometimes he can be sharp. I felt as though, not literally, but it was a slap across my face. And as, as the God was saying, you selfish guy. What about Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, when these people have to go to work? You never think about the rain then, do you? I said, no, Lord, but I know the, you know, the, the land needs rain. And then it hit me. The problem is not the rain. The problem is the drainage. And by then, the worship leader, the other pastor had finished, you know, worship announcements. My time to preach. And I have this bad attitude. And I'm sitting here on the platform and I'm supposed to go and preach. And at that moment, the Lord dropped this in my heart. I said, you know, people of God, the Lord has just spoken to me about this, and I am going to ask you together, the first thing we're going to do before I, I pray, uh, preach is we're going to pray that this drainage in the city is going to be changed. And first people started looking at me strangely, and then they began to smile. You know, knowing smile. <laughs> He's just come back, come from the south to Calcutta. He doesn't know how the city works. But I began to tell, come on, people, let's pray in Jesus' name. Lord, bring, bring healing to the drainage system. Let the city uh, drainage be replaced, all of that. And after the service, of course, we had another service. I did this, the same thing. Some of my friends in the congregation came and, you know, sort of tried to help me. Pastor, this is there. From the beginning, Calcutta has always had floods, Pastor. It's always been like this. Basically telling me, you know, don't pray a prayer that is sure to fail. That evening, a pastoral team was scheduled to go out of the city for a retreat, for a two or three days of prayer and fasting. And, of course, we traveled that evening. First session the next morning, I told our pastoral team, we need to really pray about this, you know. And even there, I felt, you know, pastors also have, they are realists sometimes. Pastor, I said, no, we are going to pray. Let's pray. And so we prayed 
first day, the other things we prayed. Second day also we prayed. And then the third day, after we had a beautiful time of prayer, came home that evening, uh, you know, and I was reclining, you know, chilling out a bit. And I was pulling out the newspapers for, of the last three days. I missed Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So I'm pulling out the newspapers. I want to read it. Monday was okay. I opened Tuesday. I like to read it in sequence. Open the Tuesday new, newspaper, front page, bottom half. Governor summons mayor regarding the flooding in the city of Calcutta. Long story short, I don't know how it is here, but in India, the governors and the president, governors and to the state, but the president is to the federal government, they are figureheads. They are meant to be caretakers when, between the, when the governments change. They don't interfere in the day-to-day -day affairs. Usually, it's the chief minister who's the political head. They are the ones who take the decisions. But this was an overactive governor, an intelligent man. He had, the, the, the newspaper article said he had researched the internet and found out that the drainage system in Calcutta was a hundred years old. He said, it's shameful that the drainage that was laid in the British time, we haven't changed. So he told the mayor, do something about it. And so, you know, the reason it was a front page article was governors are not known to do this kind of thing. So Venice. Wednesday newspaper, then I put that aside. Believe it or not, not front page, but inside page. World Bank commits $100 million to replace the drainage system in Calcutta. So next Sunday, I was excited. I put up the you know, newspaper article on the screen. The weeks went by, and then people started coming to me. Pastor, they brought these huge drainage pipes to our locality. They're digging the roads. From this side, reports came. From that side, friends, I'm happy to declare to you the flood, flooding in Calcutta is not yet perfect. We still have occasional floods. But if you compare the way it is today, 20 years to 20 years ago, today, if it rains on a Sunday morning, people can still come to church. And here is the better news. On, from Monday through Saturday, normal life can continue, even though it rains. We have blessed the city as the people of God because we believe in a God who calls us to be the difference. Yes, friends, you'll see it happening. I wish I could testify to you about the wider scenario as we have prayed and act in, encouraged our people to be the difference. People who visit Calcutta today, I've only given you one illustration. All across the city, we have seen city transformation. We can make a difference to the poverty around us. We can make a difference to the evil around us. We can make a difference if we recognize who we are in God. We have a hope for the future, but not a hope that makes us sit on our hands, but a hope that sees evil today as the enemy of the good. And we see ourselves as messengers of Jesus Christ, called to shine the light in the darkness. And remember, somebody told me this long ago, perhaps you've heard it. You can do two things when you face the darkness. You can curse it and walk away. It doesn't change things, does it? Or you can light a light. No matter how small the light no matter how insignificant the candle, the darkness is not total as long as there is a, even a ray of light in the darkness. I don't know what your circumstances are. What darkness you're facing today, my brother, my sister. But I dare you, I challenge you to light a candle. From the trauma of childbirth, to the pain of bereavement. Life is full of pain. I don't care how spiritual you are, at some point of time in your life, you will face pain. Pain of bereavement, pain of incurable disease, pain of a loss, loss of job, pain of a betrayal by a close friend. Pain. You say, why does God allow pain in our world? A very well-known 
man of God named C.S. Lewis said this. He said, God whispers to us in our pleasures, but shouts to us in our pain. Pain is God's megaphone summoning a world to pay attention to the voice of God. Pain and tragedy have a way of bringing us to our knees, friends. A place where we have nowhere to look but God, our only hope. I began with the words of a prophet and I want to conclude with the words of another prophet. This prophet is the prophet Jeremiah. He has just witnessed a massive catastrophe. His beloved city of Jerusalem has been raised to the ground. In the dark days that follow the fall of Jerusalem, he pens the book of Lamentations. I want to read a few verses for you as I bring this message to a close. Verses 17 onwards, he says, Lamentations 3, peace has been stripped away, and I have forgotten what prosperity is. I cry out, my splendor is gone. Everything I had hoped for from the Lord is lost. The thought of my suffering and homelessness is bitter beyond words. I will never forget this awful time as I grieve over my loss. He's tempted to be bitter. Where is the God of Israel as he watches my beloved Jerusalem being raised to the ground? I thank God, friends, Jeremiah discovered the secret of what it takes to make bitter better. He discovered it. Verse 21. Yet I still dare to hope when I remember this. The faithful love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. Great is His faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each morning. I say to myself, the Lord is my inheritance. Therefore, I will hope in Him. Say it with me, friends. The Lord is my inheritance. Therefore, I will hope in Him. Hebrews dis describes this hope as a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls. Yes, friends. We don't control our future. Even though you are a believer and you may be the most spiritual believer on the planet, you do not control your future. But God does. Amen? And in the midst of the uncertainty and the anxiety of what may come tomorrow, I want you to know this morning, beloved, your future is secure in the hand of an almighty God. Amen. What a powerful word. We thank God for his transformational word that brings so much change in our lives. I'm sure that you have been blessed richly by what, by what was shared today. And I know that God will continue to let his word have a dwelling place in your heart even through this week. Now, before we close, a few things I want to leave before you. At this time, I want to talk about the Lanka Lifeline. You see, if you are distressed or in a crisis or know anyone who needs help, please call the Lanka Lifeline. Now, you may be listening in today and you're saying, I want to talk to someone, someone who will take time to listen to my problem. Or maybe you know someone else. Please guide them, Lord, to the Lanka Lifeline because there is a supporter, a crisis supporter, somebody who's willing to give a listening ear and to pray with them and to bring hope even in a hopeless situation. Well, secondly, let me talk about the family altar. Every Wednesday, every family in People's Church, we want you to separate Wednesday to build your family altar. We have heard so many good stories of how families are getting together, some even virtually, as they discuss God's word and they pray. You see, if you want more information, please go to the PCAG app. 
uh, that has more information about the family altar. Uh, also, it has scriptures that you can use at your family altar this Wednesday or this week. And finally, I'm going to talk about the life journal and Bible reading plan that Pastor Deshaun has been talking about. I want you to go to the People's Church app and it will give you the scriptures, it will give you further information, how you can do what we call the SOAP, S-O-A-P. So find more information in the app. It will give you all the direction you need even as you continue to study God's Word to the New Testament in the next six months to the Bible reading plan given therein. So I want to thank every one of you for joining in to the People's Church online service. I want to pray that God's blessing would be with you throughout this week with you and your family. God bless you. Have a special week.